Good morning, everyone. I'm Carol Olson Day of the New York Times, and I am delighted to welcome you to this exciting Times Talks. We're live here at the Times Center in New York, and we're live around the world on the web. This is the first of four special conversations today, celebrating the fifth annual New York City Wine and Food Festival, which benefits the Food Bank for New York City and share our strength, and of which we are proud to be a sponsor. Our guest today has had a remarkable career, and including, <laughs> to name just a few, the first chief technology officer at Microsoft, a postdoctoral fellow with Stephen Hawking at Cambridge, a first place winner in the World Championship of Barbecue, <laughs> a prolific inventor and founder of Intellectual Ventures, and co-author of Modernist Cuisine, a definitive and award-winning guide to the modernist food movement. And now, we can do modernist food at home. His latest book, Modernist Cuisine at Home, is a gorgeously illustrated, comprehensive guide to cooking more than 400 recipes at home and he'll be signing it today. You'll meet him in just a moment, but first I'm delighted to introduce our interviewer. He joined the New York Times two years ago as a dining reporter after having written for many of the top magazines. He's also author of the book, X Saves the World, and his work has been included in such anthologies as Best American Non-Required Reading, Best Food Writing, and best creative nonfiction. A few weeks ago, he wrote in the dining section about the new acceptance for vegans in the top rated restaurants in Los Angeles, which constituted a terrific guide to eating out in LA for vegans and non-vegans alike. And it was accompanied by some amazing mouth-watering photographs. So please join me in welcoming New York Times dining reporter, Jeff Gordinier, and our very special guest, Dr. Nathan Mirvold. Good to see you. Thanks for being here, Nathan. My pleasure. My bio sounded kind of pathetic compared to yours, <laughs> I have to say. Well, I, I love that not required reading part. But you know, as an author, you'd actually prefer to be required reading, right? <laughs> than everyone I would have to read you. That would be the goal. Um, so, uh, so to, to get us started here, um, before we get into our adventures with food, I wanted to get into sort of the roots of your fixation on food. And um, Thanksgiving is just around the corner. So I, I understand that when you were nine years old, you, you inflicted a sort of unique Thanksgiving upon your family. Can you tell us a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, so I, I decided that I was gonna cook Thanksgiving dinner. And I went to the library and got all these cookbooks, including Escoffier. Um, I, at nine. At nine, oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, and then I told my mom I was gonna cook, I had to shop all myself, and I had to cook it all myself. Um, now I discovered Escoffier is not like the go-to place for Thanksgiving dinner, <laughs> okay? Um, uh, for two reasons. One is that uh, it didn't have turkey <laughs> or a whole variety of other uh, you know, traditional dishes in it. The, the other thing is that Escoffier was written in an age where a cookbook was for someone who was already a cook. Mm. So a typical Escoffier recipe says, place in a hot oven and cook until done. You say, well, how do you know? <laughs> right, you're nine years old. How do you know what cook until done is? Um, but the, the book I, I, I did the most dishes from that, um, uh, that year was a book called The Pyromaniacs Cookbook because it involved uh, flambéing things. I thought that was so cool that you would light stuff on fire. Um, the next Thanksgiving, I actually had, it was the first time I had a, a dish that we named. Um, and my brother collaborated me with, with a, he was two years younger than me, so I was 10 and, and he was, um, I, I guess uh, that would make him eight. Uh, so, <laughs> we called it Firecracker Surprise. <laughs> and basically, I had a, 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 a dome over this thing, and as I whipped it up, he lit a firecracker and put it under the table. <laughs> <laughs> Almost killed some of the elderly uh, relatives. <laughs> 
that's reassuring. <laughs> um, now, uh, you spent a little time at a company uh, called Microsoft, yeah. I believe. <laughs> um, well, you know, literally, when I first started working there, uh, I would check into a hotel or something, and I'd say, well, where do you work for? I said, Microsoft, and there'd be a blank stare. I'd say, well, we're this little software company yeah. in Redmond, Washington. And, you know, eventually, I didn't have to say that. No, no, I wouldn't <laughs> think you would have to ID it anymore. Now, I, t I tend to associate techies with, you know, sort of eating bean burritos at their desk. Um, so did your, did your Epicurean interests set you apart? Well, <clears throat> yes. <laughs> um, and and uh, for, you know, when you're writing code day and night, uh, you, the, the basic food groups are caffeine right. in various forms and pizza and, <laughs> and things like that. So, and sure, I did that too, uh, but I'd always been interested in food. Um, at one point, I actually decided instead of just being self-taught, I ought to go to chef school. Right. And so I went to Bill Gates and asked for a leave of absence to go to a chef school in France, which I think I'm the only person to ever ask Bill for that. <laughs> um, Weren't you working at a restaurant as well in Seattle? Well, then the, the chef school wouldn't take me. Uh, Why not? Until, well, they said, they called up, they said, well, sir, this is a professional chef school. You must send us your resume. So I sent them a resume, and then I got this call. Sir, would this be a change of career? <laughs> I said, well, not exactly. Mm. I said, well, we, we, we can't take you unless, um, unless you've got some professional work experience. Ah. But it happened that a previous graduate of the school was, was in Seattle. So they called this woman up. And they said, is there some place he can go train? And she said, well, yeah, there's a very good chef, uh, French restaurant here, so he could go train there. Uh, so for uh, two years, I went one night a week and cooked at that restaurant. Um, and I, I learned a tremendous amount. I, I probably learned more in the prerequisite for the cooking school mm. than at the cooking school. Mm. Um, now, many years later, as it turned out, that uh, woman, Cynthia Nims, who had set that up, uh, actually collaborated on modernist cuisine. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, yes. wow. Now, how did you manage working at a restaurant sometimes and Microsoft, too? Did you clone yourself? Did you <laughs> Just not sleep? Well, on, uh, I usually would do Thursdays. Mm -hmm. um, and so Thursdays, uh, I'd work at Microsoft until uh, noon, 1 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And then I'd go in and we'd cook prep, and then we'd cook through service. And I'd go home around uh, you know, 10, 10.30. Oh, I see. And uh, yeah, we worked all the time that you're at Microsoft, like constantly. So um, I, I could probably get, I, I didn't really ask, I just did it. Is Bill Gates much of a foodie? I mean, what was his response to, to this interest of yours? Um, I, I don't think Bill would describe himself as much of a foodie. Yeah. yeah I, you know, like everybody, he enjoys food, but I don't think food is his driving passion in life. Right. Um, he was quite um, puzzled by my request when I first asked. Was he? What did he say? And uh, then l later, many years later now, of course, my book comes out, and he, he tweeted immediately when he got his copy. And he has told me it is the only cookbook he's ever opened. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> now, before you, you opened the lab, which we're going to talk about, mm -hmm. and before you had this, this you know, d desire to publish modernist cuisine, um, was there an epiphany? I understand there was some meal you had at the Fat Duck, Heston Blumenthal's restaurant mm -hmm. in England. Um, was there a moment that you had a sort of conversion experience about it? Well, after leaving Microsoft in 1999, uh, I started cooking a lot more. I, I built a big new kitchen, and uh, I had a lot of cool new equipment in it. And I sort of naively thought that there would be some big book I could buy that would tell me all about what the latest cooking techniques were. Ah. Yeah, I, I was familiar with the classic cooking techniques, and there's many big, wonderful books. You might, Culinary Institute of America has one, and French Culinary Institute has theirs, and the, the, those, these big books uh, will take you through all the techniques of, say, classic French cuisine, or classic Italian cuisine, or if you look for a different set of books, classic Chinese cuisine. Mm -hmm. um, so classic stuff is well covered. Um, but I wanted to kind of do the latest cutting edge cool stuff, which, as it happened, uh, started to be inspired by science. Well, I knew something about science, and so the A idea <laughs> of, of using principles from science or equipment from science for cooking, that sort of resonated with me. Mm -hmm. But I quickly discovered there was no book like that. There was no reference. Um, it, there's an on online site called eGullet 
that, uh, that I discovered was hugely influential all this because on the e-gullet was a combination of people who were cooks at home mm -hmm. uh, to essentially every great kitchen in the world had somebody who was on e-gullet. Mm -hmm. um, if, if the head chef was younger, it would be the head chef. If it, if it was a really classic, you know, old time uh, French thing, one of the younger guys in the kitchen was still in, in the internet enough. And it was very clear from the postings there that nobody knew all of what was going on. Huh. And there was a tremendous interest in brand new techniques, but it was very hard for people to learn new techniques. You know, they, uh, there's a classic thing in cooking where you are a stagiaire, it's a French term for apprentice basically. So you'll go for a period of time and cook in a kitchen. Mm -hmm. And if you went to be a stagiaire at El Bui, this uh, restaurant, um, uh, Ferran Adria's restaurant north of Barcelona in Spain, or at the Fat Duck or at other places, you, if you went there and spent you know, three months or six months cooking, you'd learn a few of the techniques. Not all, but a few. Mm -hmm. But then you have to go to the next one and the next one and the next one. Um, but there also had been a lot of interest in food science. Um, Harold McGee had uh, written a book in the 1984 called On Food and Cooking, which was uh, one of the first big books to discuss how the impact of science on cooking. That In fact, uh, the laws of chemistry and physics are involved in cooking, and so shouldn't we know what they are? Sure. Um, but it, there was still tons of things in food science that uh, a food scientist somewhere might understand, but it had never been communicated to chefs. Right. And chefs understood things the food scientists didn't know, and the chefs understood things that they didn't know each other. Um, so I started posting on eGullet uh, as I started figuring things out. I was working particularly on sous vide uh -huh. cooking. And had you built the lab yet then? No, no, not at that point I, I had see. not built the lab. Um, uh, I, uh, I realized that a lot of the issues with sous vide came up because you were cooking, uh, as a nerd like me would say, in a different part of parameter space than you normally were in. Mm -hmm. So normally you cook with very high heat. Um, so you, you're typically, you've got a gas flame that's maybe 1500 degrees. You put a pan on it, the surface of the pan is maybe 400 degrees. Um, and you're trying to cook your steak so that the inside of the steak is 125 degrees. Now, why are you using all that high heat? Well, there's a couple of reasons, but a side effect of this is you have to time it very exactly. Because if you don't time it exactly, you're not going to, uh, you'll overshoot. You won't get 125, which would be rare. You might get 140, which is more like medium, or you might have well, or it might be raw. And so timing becomes this really important thing because you're, you're using a sledgehammer to, to drive in a, a little finishing nail. Mm. Um, and and there's, there's no point in that. Now, so this sous vide, in case people don't know, is basically cooking things at low heat in water and basically putting the food in a bag and having it kind of float around. But the essence of it is cooking with really low heat right. and often for long periods of time. Uh, and all of that was counterintuitive to all of the rules which have been built up around uh, high heat cooking. Sure. So being the nerd that I am, uh, I wrote thousands of lines of code to uh, do computer modeling of how heat goes through food. Um, which is, of course, that's the first thing you do. Um, <laughs> I, do I know I do, yeah. There, uh, there's a lot of counterintuitive or or, or interesting things that come from that. Well, so, one of the assumptions that people have is that, well, how do you know it's cooked? I mean, because even if you look at sous vide food, it doesn't necessarily look cooked in the way we sure. come to think of it. Well, and, and that's the glory of it, is you can achieve effects you couldn't achieve any other way. Mm -hmm. But here's the, the first sort of ex, uh, question that I, uh, I asked, which is, suppose you've got a steak that's an inch thick, and you're cooking it. It doesn't matter whether it's sous vide or any other way. Because the inside of the steak is cooking by conduction. Sure. Right? Heat comes in the edges of the steak and it migrates to the center. And that's a solid item, and we know very well how heat moves through a solid. Okay, so you've got your inch thick steak, and suppose it takes a certain amount of time to cook. You have a two inch thick steak. How much longer does it take the two inch thick steak to cook? Um, and it, essentially, no cookbook I have ever seen addresses this question. Um, and the, the answer is it, it is, takes about four times as long, mm -hmm. roughly, because uh, diffusion scales roughly like the square of the thickness. Mm -hmm. 
Now that's a very simple rule to say. Like you triple the thickness, it's nine times longer. Okay, that's why we have a thing called a roast versus a steak. Well, what's the difference between a ribeye steak and a prime rib roast? The thickness. That's the, it's the same piece of meat, but one of them you might roast for hours, and the other one you're cooking for minutes. Why? Well, because of this effect. Right. Um, and it, that was an example of something that uh, was sort of that was a bit of an epiphany to say, look, why doesn't why don't cookbooks say? The th you know, scale it to the thickness, and it goes like the square. Sure. So if you wanted to cook really fast, cut it thin. Now we're going to get to some images of steaks and, <laughs> and being uh, put through the sous vide treatment and, and blow torched. Um, but first, let's, I think we have an image of uh, the book itself. This is what yep. eventually was produced. It's not really a book. It's, it's bigger than that. Um, and now you published this yourself. Yep. Was there any concern about expenditure? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, there's an old saying about the wine business that I adapt to the cookbook business, which is I found out how to make a small fortune in the cookbook business. You start with a large fortune and you go into the cookbook <laughs> business. Um, Were you worried about losing money? Uh, on this particular thing, we didn't. Right. And you know, there's two fundamental ways you can design a product, and, and they're both valid, uh, but the, the one approach, which is what most companies take, is they say, what do they want? And they is some demographic or some market segment. And you do market research, and you do focus groups and interviews. And it's all about what do they want. It makes plenty of sense. I, I, it, it's logical. There's another way to do it. The other way to do it says, make the thing you love, mm -hmm. and then hope that there's someone who agrees that what you love is also what they love. Sure. And most of the best things on earth have been made the second way. That's what art is about. It's about creating something that the artist loves, not, not something that was designed to meet some market research thing of what they want. Now, the problem is, all of the world great disasters were also made the second way. <laughs> Because you can fool yourself that it's what, what that other people will love it as much as you, and they don't. Um, it, now, now I wanted to ask you, you mentioned art. It's interesting because one of the things that struck me about um, reading modernist cuisine books and about it is, is a comparison to modernist dance, poetry, music, fiction. Um, in what way uh, does what you're pursuing echo those, those forms, those, um, those genres? Well, so, so I think cooking can be an art. It also can be a craft. And in most uh, other aesthetic aspects of life, there's a pretty clear div division between art with a capital A, meaning it's going to wind up in the Met or MoMA or someplace like that, versus crafts. And they're both honorable things. Uh, another word that is associated with craft is artisan, as opposed to artist, right? which is over on the other side. Well, food spans both. Uh, food has the ability to engage our emotions and our thoughts in a profound way, as, at least as profound as visual things do in painting uh, or uh, that words do in literature. So I think cooking can be an art. Uh, it isn't always an art. In many other cases, it is more of a craft. Uh, and, I think that if you empower people to know how cooking works, uh, then you've empowered people to do both. You can treat it as a craft and say, yes, I'm going to make the best steak, for example. You go to a steakhouse, the chef has no control. You pick the cut of meat, how much it weighs, how it's done, what sauce, what side dish. There's essentially no room for artistry in a steakhouse, which is perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But you don't go to MoMA and say, here's what I'd like to see, exactly this. No, no, the whole point is the artist is going to challenge you, sometimes disturb you, um, sometimes make you mad, sometimes, mm. but that's part of what art is. Well, cooking can also do that. Well, let's talk about that challenge aspect because it was interesting when I was preparing for this and I talked to people about you and your work and people who weren't familiar with it. They'd say, well, look, there's centuries of cooking People know how to roast a chicken. They know how to. Why do we need immersion circulators and centrifuges? Why would we do that? Like the why question. <laughs> well, why not? <laughs> um, but uh, you know, 
first of all, the point, one of the big points of the book was to explain how cooking works. Sure. So we explain really how, how a roast chicken works, what happens in the oven. Of course. And we yeah. came up with this idea of cutaway photos where we cut things in half so we could literally show what's happening you know, while you cook. And I think that's important no matter how you want to do it. Sure. And I'm not going to tell anybody how to eat. And if you want to eat a, in a particular aesthetic and a particular thing, that's great. But if you're curious about how it works, then I think our books are a way to tell you how those things actually function. And then empowered by that, you can use that to continue to do something else. Which, um, is, which actually leads us to the uh, Modernist yes, that, Cuisine at Home. That's the new book, Modernist is, Cuisine at Home. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, th this is a sandwich we prepared for the International Space Station where there is no gravity. <laughs> Let's see. Now, and here's the laboratory, right, yep. in Seattle. Tell us a little bit about that. So uh, around the time that I, um, uh, I really got to work heavily on the cookbook, uh, my company was building a lab uh, because we do invention of all kinds of, of things. So we were building a lab and a machine shop, a chemistry lab, a biology lab, this big machine shop area. And frankly, we'd rented a building a little bit bigger than we needed. So I said, hey, uh, let's just take a few thousand square feet. And let's, let's We'll, we'll build a lab there for doing the cookbook. Um, uh, for one thing, that meant I wasn't underfoot at home <laughs> doing all the crazy experiments. So th this is our, our cooking lab. Uh, this is the, uh, our, our cooking lab for the, um, uh, for the, the home book. Mm -hmm. Now, if we expanded out, zoomed out from this picture, you would see, in fact, it's all fake. This is built in a corner of the other lab. <laughs> So the, this isn't really a home kitchen. Um, we, we went to IKEA and we bought a little bit of furniture. Um, and we, uh, the people at Viking were nice enough to give us that stove, which we cooked with for about six, eight months. Then we cut it in half. It's, it's a little bit like that's the, what you do, because well, that's how you roll. It's kind of like the 4-H <laughs> kid that gets a little calf and grow, raises it up and then sends it to market. <laughs> but. Uh, Yep, that's what we do. Now, um, a lot of your work is associated with science, but when we were backstage, we were talking a little bit about um, aspects of the book that are not explicitly scientific, shall we say. And one of the things that struck me and moved me about um, the Modernist Cuisine at Home book is your approach to salad. I'm mm -hmm. a big fan of salad. I like to make a lot of salads. And um, let's talk a little bit about that, like, like some, of the, some of your tips on how to make a, an excellent salad. So salad is a great example of something which is widely done, uh, but I think could probably be done better. Now, one approach is to say, here's recipes. And most cookbooks have a recipe-oriented view, which is perfectly valid and wonderful. I'm not criticizing it per se, but a recipe says, do this, do this, do this, do this. And if you follow exactly what they do, you'll get pretty much the result that was intended. But it's limiting because it's do this, do this, do this, do this. If you understand the principle behind it, then you don't need the recipe as mm. much. And you can adapt it to whatever is available to you at the moment. You know, if you, so we tried to explain what the principles of a salad are. Uh, so rather than having lots of recipes of here's this salad and here's that salad, here's the principles that we think make a great salad. Uh, combinations of flavors. Right? The, the, the two great things in cooking are either to com compare things so you have multiple uh, flavors that reinforce each other, or to make contrasts. Well, texture, the same thing. And so if you, we went through this process saying, well, here's how you should think about the things you put in your salad. Here's how some basic ways of making dressings. Right. And then empowered by those principles, go for it. And even where the make dressing it, goes, the where should the dressing go? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, of course, it all depends on the effect that you want. Sure. But, uh, Normally, what you really want with dressing is to have a little bit of it spread I properly uh, on, on the stuff. It, the typical way that people dress a salad puts a big glop of it in one place. Right. So you get a bite that's like all blue cheese dressing and, and uh, it is over seasoned and has a whole variety of other things. Then you get a bunch of dry lettuce in another bite. Um, my favorite way to dress a salad is by hand. Okay, so it, it, it's. Uh, Rub, rub the, take each leaf and run your fingers uh, over it. Uh, and that way you get a little, a very thin coating of the dressing, 
which is really all you need. Mm -hmm. And you're actually going to wind up using a lot less oil. It's a lot less um, caloric as a result because you've managed to distribute it properly. Wait, you, now do you put dressing in the bottom of the bowl first and then just start doing it with your hand? Um, no immersion circulators here. This no is just, immersion this is circulators. This, this is by hand. Um, yeah, the, in fact, it's, it's interesting. With a salad, typically what you want to do is distribute the dressing. Mm -hmm. That's very different than what I do with salt. Okay, so for salt, I advocate sort of the opposite thing of, for salt, I like to put salt on right at the end, mm -hmm. usually fairly coarse salt, usually right on top. Because the impression of saltiness that you get is in part by having this kick of salt. Um, and you can get by with a lot less overall salt if you have it concentrated. Right. So in that case, right. distributing it widely, uh, you know, one of the reasons there's a high salt content in fast foods, in canned foods, processed foods, is because they put it in really early and it's distributed all the way through mm. and it doesn't give you that impression of saltiness. Mm. Uh, it's just sunk in. It's, it's, it's sunk in, and right. so then people will well, add a little bit more on top, and uh, it, it, uh, it, it, I think you get a better overall result in that case by concentration, whereas with dressing, I think it's better off if it's distributed. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to, uh, ah, some sous vide action going on here. Now, one of the things that's interesting about the book is you're saying you don't necessarily need you know, expensive equipment to do sous vide. You could do it in a hot tub. Yep. You could do it in, do it in your sink. Yeah, you could so, do it in um, like a cooler, so, so talk about that a little bit. And in a Ziploc bag, clearly. Uh, well, the, the key idea behind sous vide is cooking at low temperature. And the most convenient way to cook at low temperature is to uh, immerse the food in hot water because water winds up having a good heat transfer uh, property and it's pretty easy to make hot water. Um, so for uh, sous vide salmon, we have a recipe, I've, I've done it on Martha Stewart, <laughs> um, uh, we do it all the time, where you don't need any equipment at all, you just run a sink or a big pot full of hot water. And literally the tap water, mo in most places, is the right temperature. Use a digital thermometer to make sure you've got the right temperature of the thing, then you just seal the stuff up into uh, Ziploc bags and dunk it in the water. Just let it flow. And, and then the way, we like having salmon particularly at low temperature. Um, so uh, our ideal for salmon is somewhere between 104 degrees and 113 degrees. Um, that, that it, 113 if you want it to look, up, uh, look like it's cooked salmon. At 104 degrees, uh, it's not going to be, uh, it, it'll still look raw, but it'll be cooked. Well, that's about the temperature of a hot tub. And so you actually can have a salmon thing where you get in a hot tub with your, your salmon. <laughs> Um, the, the picture you just showed a moment ago, if we can go back to that, that's... Uh, so this is our tailgater steak recipe. So here you, uh, you fill a, a big cooler full of hot water, put your steaks in these bags, put them in. As long as you have got a lot or high ratio of water to the steak, there's enough residual heat. You don't need to heat it anymore. You, you close it up. Um, it'll keep for about four hours. Um, and you, you go to your tailgate party or you go camping or so forth. Then you make a hot grill and just grill them for a few seconds on each side to, to brown them and you've got perfectly done steak. Well, that's one thing people might ask about is how do you get a little crust on there? But as you see here, yep. the, the sous vide steak has a crust on it, um, which leads me to the question of uh, should I invest in a blowtorch? Right. I highly recommend investing in a blowtorch. <laughs> um, <coughs> awesome. My kids are going to love that. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> So um, uh, a blowtorch is a terrific cooking tool uh, because it allows you to have really high heat as you direct it in, in a specific place. Uh, so uh, we use it for searing steaks. Um, you can also sear steak in a pan, but even when you sear it in a pan, it, I like searing the edge of the steak also. and it's, You can do that in a pan too if you hold it with tongs and kind of uh, put it up in there, but it's it's simpler to use a blowtorch. And the, the well, twenty dollar blowtorch from Home Depot works just super well. Oh, right on. Yeah. <laughs> well, also you're seeing here is there's the deep fry method, right? After yeah. you do the sous vide, you basically drop the steak in oil and just. So sous vide is about cooking. Uh, to, to go back to what I was saying earlier about cooking with high heat, cooking with high heat is problematic if for cooking the center of a steak, because 
you're cooking with something much hotter than you normally do. And if you want your steak medium rare, that means you want it typically about 130 degrees on the inside. But if you cook it uh, with a broiler with, over a char, um, you know, over a grill, um, if you cook it in a hot pan, uh, you're going to wind up having thick gray bands around the edges. And on a typical steak, 25 to 30 percent of the meat is actually that thick band, and it's overcooked. So instead of doing this, what we like to do is we cook the center one way, and then you cook the surface another way. And we cook the surface another way because most people like the texture and the flavor of the browning reactions that occur there. So here we're using a blowtorch to sear the steak. That looks um, fun. It's great <laughs> amounts of fun. Um, you can deep fry the steak. You can shallow fry the steak, like in a cast iron pan. Mm -hmm. um, another one of the recipes that we have in the book, which doesn't require sous vide equipment, is you take a frozen steak right out of the freezer, take a cast iron pan, put a little bit of high heat oil in it, um, rice bran oil, uh, safflower oil, they're both really high heat oils. You heat it up until the oil's almost smoking, so it's just, and you sear the steak while it's frozen. Um, and that, that will put a beautiful brown sear on the outside, but it won't cook the inside of the steak. Mm. Then you put the steak in your oven at the very lowest setting. Uh, and because ovens, most home ovens are not super accurate at the lowest setting, you're gonna have to check it periodically with a, a, a thermometer. But in 30 minutes to an hour or so, um, it will cook the, the interior perfectly. So and it'll look like that. So here, now what's happening here, one of the things that's interesting about this picture is we have kind of a classic barbecue grill, and there's, uh, there's some fire on one side and I believe some ice on the other side? Yes. So what's going on? Well, first I have to tell a story about the, the barbecue. I was in um, Oslo recently eating at the best restaurant in Norway. It's part of this whole uh, movement of great Scandinavian cuisine, course, the yeah. restaurant called Noma in um, uh, Copenhagen that's also part of that movement. And one of the, the dishes come out and they say, yes, and this was grilled on davaba. I said, davaba? <laughs> and they point out to this outdoor balcony the restaurant has, and there's a Weber grill. Ah, uh, davaba. And I start laughing. And they say, no, 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 the, the, the Weber, the Weber grill is, it, it, it's like this cult phenomenon in Norway that it's this very, very expensive, exotic thing. And <laughs> I said, well, okay. <laughs> Um, but uh, so one of the uses, when people say the term barbecue, they tend to put two different things together. One approach to barbecuing is grilling. And grilling is about cooking meat over super high heat, right over coals. And most of the flavor that is generated in uh, that grilling is that fat from the, the meat drips onto the coals and has these fat flare ups. Um, when people grill vegetables, like they grill a zucchini, and they wonder why it doesn't have that charbroiled taste, it's because there's no fat in a zucchini to drip. So what we recommend is you squirt some olive oil down there, or, or, or other kind of oil, and that will make the flare-ups, and you'll get the, the more grilled flavor for your zucchini. Anyway, grilling is one approach to barbecue. But in the southern United States, or southeastern United States, barbecue means smoking with very low heat over a long period of time. Sure. So, the Weber grill here is really designed for doing grilling, but you can use it for doing smoking. And to do that, you have a very small fire with very few briquettes. You put a bunch of wood chips on it, because it's the wood chips that will make the smoke flavor. Um, you probably soak those wood chips in, um, in water first, because it helps lower the temperature. Even then, you typically can't get the, um, the temperature to be what you'd really like, so you put a bunch of ice in there. And it, it, this may seem like driving with your foot on both the brake and the, the gas pedal simultaneously, and it kind of is, uh, but it's a way that you can get the, the right temperature in there. Typically what you'd like to achieve is a temperature somewhere between 140 degrees and maybe 190 degrees. Mm. Um, I, I would say as low as possible, so 140 degrees would be my preference. Um, and it's hard to do that, in one of these grills because there's a lot of heat given off by the, uh, by the charcoal. Uh, but with this technique, you can make it work. I mean, this leads to a question I had as I approached this, which was, you know, one of the things I love to do is roast a chicken 
baste the skin with butter, put some herbs on there, and part of the pleasure of it in the household is the scent of it, you know, and the ritual of it and the way it sort of fills up the house with that. And there's a perception that modernist cuisine, in a way, uh, circumvents that pleasure, that it's all taking place in bags and machines and stuff. Well, so the, there's a couple of interesting points there. The first thing is, if your kitchen smells good, your food lost something. Really? Oh, well, look, it, it's the fact you're smelling it means it's a volatile flavor compound mm. which evaporated. It means it's not in the food anymore. And, and it, I mean, it's, it's seriously true mm. that when your kitchen smells good, you've taken something out of your food. And say, oh yes, we've simmered it for hours and the, kitchen's, the house smells great. And, and the greater your kitchen smells, the less is in there. Now, if you've put enough herbs or other things in, then maybe you can compensate for that. But you are losing when you do that. I feel like the Grinch just stole Christmas well, or something. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, uh, you know, when you go to um, one of the tricks that they use in those uh, cookie stores in malls, uh -huh. um, Mrs. Fields and things like that, is that wonderful aroma isn't just from the baking. In fact, typically, they are not allowed to vent the, bake, the actual baking oven into the mall. So they have a hot plate in back, and they pour a vanilla extract into a pan. And that's what you're smelling, oh, is vanilla extract uh, boiling away in the back. Like, oh, wow, that smells great. Well, yes, it's, it's vanilla. Um, Do so, you get any antagonism from, from more traditional chefs about the kind of work? I mean, obviously, there are a lot of modernist chefs who, whose work echoes what you're exploring. But do, do you, are there traditionalists who, who take issue with it? Sure. Um, but uh, the interesting thing is that there are, there's very few traditionalists that, that take issue with it if they've actually seen it. Sure. Um, I generally find that people who are critical of the book, particularly from a traditional perspective, haven't actually seen it. Right. Um, well, that makes it easier. Uh, you know, the, there, was, um, <laughs> there was a thing in the press last year where people tried to make out that Alice Waters didn't like our cookbook. Oh, uh -huh. And Alice immediately sent me an email saying, no, I love the book. Uh -huh. And that doesn't mean that she's going to cook that way at Chez Panisse. Um, but it, it's hard to see the photos of, uh, of the food. And it's hard to see some of the things that we do and hate it, because it, if you love food, we clearly love food, too. We're explaining stuff that's interesting and important. Uh, they don't have to cook in plastic bags. Um, and in fact, you can cook, do sous vide cooking without ever using a plastic bag, by the way. But many of the ideas are, are similar. Sure. You know, we, we make a roast chicken, which is a lot more complicated than, than the recipe that you described. It involves syringes, does it not? It does involve syringes. <laughs> um, but. But here's why. Okay, roast chicken is an example of a traditional cooking thing. And you find this in lots of traditional cooking. That is fundamentally a contradiction. And the contradiction is you'd like the breast meat to be moist and juicy. And you'd like the skin to be crispy. And they're right beside each other. So to get the skin crispy, you've got to cook the hell out of it. And as soon as you do that, you overcook the, the inside. So what do you do? Well, we decided that roast chicken, in fact, we have sort of an attitude that Every dish is worthy of asking the question, at least, what's the best possible version of that dish? Um, now, some people say, no, 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 the, the, you should only do the best possible thing for an elaborate dish, something you might get at, at Per Se or Danielle. And uh, you know, a, a hamburger, a roast chicken, that's sort of a plebeian. We say, no, if you care about hamburgers, by God, we're going to tell you how to make the ultimate hamburger. Sure. And you don't have to make the ultimate hamburger every day. Maybe you don't make it ever. But if you love hamburgers, here's the ultimate hamburger. Um, or the ultimate ice cream, which, which I wanted to talk about okay. a little bit. Um, the, uh, you, you make a, basically a pistachio gelato that we were talking about a bit backstage that you think is the best ice cream in the world. And it happens to be vegan. Yeah. So n normally, if you said it, you were going to make vegan ice cream. Um, most people, even vegans, would roll their eyes a little bit and say, OK, it's going to be some kind of a compromise. It will be an ice cream-like substance. Um, uh, but in this case, pistachio, uh, which is one of my favorite ice cream flavors, uh, you rarely get good pistachio ice cream. And the reason is that pistachio is fairly mild uh, flavor. 
So by the time you add the cream and you add the eggs, you get green ice cream, not pistachio ice cream. Um, so much so that what a lot of chefs do is they add almond extract. Uh, because you need some flavor in there, and, and the almond extract will, you'll sort of, you'll think it's a nut kind of a thing, even as, though it's not actually pistachio. Well, we realized that dairy cream is an emulsion of milk fat and water with a little bit of protein that stabilizes it. So why can't we make cream out of any fat? So we, uh, we take pistachio oil, and we homogenize that with water and then add ground pistachios in. Uh, so this ice cream really has three principal ingredients, water, pistachios, and sugar. Um, we add a little bit of stabilizer to, to, to hold it together just long enough to make ice cream out of it. And it tastes intensely of pistachios. Mm. But it also has perfect ice cream flavor and, um, and, 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 to my mind, a perfect texture also. So it's an example of something that uh, is the best ice cream, yet I, I don't think I could legally sell it as ice cream since there's no cream in it. Mm. <laughs> so, so a centrifuge is used for this, is it to? Um, we, the, well, we love the centrifuge. So a centrifuge is a machine that spins stuff really fast. What's the speed? Isn't it like, you know, 20,000 times the speed of Earth or something like uh, that? There's some, <laughs> some, I saw some number. So it's about 27,000 times Earth's normal gravity is the okay, force that it does. You're the scientist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's more than 27 times Earth's speed because Earth doesn't turn very fast. But uh. um, anyway, uh, the point of this is if I you've ever had, um, if you've ever had uh, fresh squeezed orange juice separate in, in your fridge to, so that you get this layer of pulp at the bottom, and or, or if you've ever had uh, 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 peanut butter, uh, you, know, you, you get organic peanut butter and you open it up. And there's like this thick layer of oil on the top, and then there's this super dense peanut butter sludge down at the bottom. Well, that's because things are separating by density. And with a centrifuge, you can separate things by density uh, much more quickly because the force that it, the, the, the food experiences is much higher than normal gravity. So something that might take days to separate otherwise, you can do very quickly. Um, and so, yeah, we do normally use a centrifuge, but actually you can get almost the same thing just by letting the ground pistachios sit. Oh. Sit right. out on the counter for a little bit, and the oil will come to the top, just like it does with peanut butter. And now, hyper-decanting is something you do in this as well? Can you talk about that? Yeah, so <laughs> uh, we decided in the, our, our first book to have a whole chapter on wine. Um, and one of the, uh, wine is a thing that's part of a meal, but it's treated with a reverence and a mystique that is like it's some weird religious cult thing. Um, it, it, you know, there's this hushed sort of tones, and uh, people who are confident in ordering things from the menu are intimidated by the sommelier who, who, and, and the, this whole thing, and so you wind up getting the more expensive wine than you wanted because you don't want to disappoint your date, and this guy is acting like you should know all these things. Um, well. So, so we have a, a chapter in wine that's a little bit irreverent in a variety of ways. And one of those ways is hyper decanting. So you decant wine, uh, particularly a younger red wine, uh, because it's going to, uh, it has a bunch of effects on, on the thing. It makes, it, it tends to make it smoother, it makes it more drinkable. So what the hell, if it decanting works, why don't we do it more so? So hyper decanting, you should all try this at home. You take a, a blender, you pour your bottle of wine into the blender, and you hit frappe. <laughs> um, put the lid on. Otherwise, it's hard to get those red wine stains out of the ceiling. Now, there are two reasons to do this. One is all of the benefits you would normally get from decanting, you get even more so this way. Uh, you do it for about 30 seconds. The wine will have this big, thick head. It looks like the head on beer. But it will very quickly dissipate. But the other reason to do this is the looks on people's faces. <laughs> oh my God! That's what you're after, isn't so, it? So you know, if, in, in terms the of the, about. in terms of the the church of the religion of fine wine, this is desecration. Um, Does it taste markedly better? Yes, <laughs> in, in almost no, not not for every. I wouldn't do this for a very old wine, um, which you typically will. You can't differently than you would a very young wine. But uh, in blind taste tests, it almost always wins. 
Um, I, I did this. It's once. a great thing to do if somebody brings over like a four hundred dollar bottle of wine. Just just let me pour that in the blender first. Um, so it, it, I did this for one of the top winemakers in Spain to his favorite vintage of his favorite wine. <laughs> and you know, thank God he's a Spanish duke. And thank God they don't carry swords these days. <laughs> uh, so then we, we, we tasted it blind. And everyone, including him, picked the blended one. So he thought we'd pulled a fast one. He says, now we will do another bottle, but I will watch. <laughs> and sure enough, second bottle. So immediately he gets on the phone to the, the people back at his winery. And I, I, I speak some Spanish, but it was this blizzard of words. And then, blender, blender. <laughs> <laughs> I want to throw out some words here. Agar, agar, N-zorbit, sodium citrate, malic acid or malic acid? Malic. Malic acid, xanthan gum. Um, should we have these? Yum. Jum? Yum, 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 yum. Oh. these are great. <laughs> yeah, wow, chemicals, yum. Um, should we have yeah, these ingredients in our pantries and why? So people ask me, isn't your food chock full of chemicals? I would say, yes, and it's even more chock full of elements. <laughs> because of course, everything is a chemical. Sure. And uh, it, you know, we put chemicals in muffins to make them rise. It's called baking powder, or baking soda. Uh, we, uh, we use chemi a chemical called sodium chloride, salt, um, and sugar, sucrose. We use all of these things all the time. And there are some that are lesser known than others. Agar agar is a seaweed extract which has been used in uh, Asia for more than 1,000 years. It's older than gelatin. Okay, um, And by the way, gelatin is created by boiling pig skins. So is it really more disgusting to have something that was made by boiling seaweed than boiling pigskins? Now, not that I'm anti-gelatin, mind you. We, we use gelatin also. But the idea that, oh, it's OK to use gelatin, because in the Western tradition, we've done this for a long time. But it's not OK to use agar, because they've used it in Japan for a long time. That's weird, uh, to me, anyway. So, um, you know, sodium citrate uh, is a, um, it sounds very chemical-ish. It's also called sour salt. It's part of the Passover Seder. Uh, it's in every store in New York as a result. Um, and it has an amazing effect on melting cheese. Right. You put a little bit of this in, and the cheese won't separate. Um, so if you've ever had a pizza that has like pools of grease on top, and then the cheese is like super stringy and grainy underneath, um, that's because the emulsion broke when the cheese melted. So we have a mac and cheese recipe, a whole chapter, in fact, in our new book on mac right. and cheese, where you add just a tiny bit of this sodium citrate, and the cheese melts perfectly, which means the cheese sauce tastes like cheese. Because normally what you do to make a cheese sauce is you add lots of starch. And the starch both adds a lot of carbohydrate to the thing, but it dulls the flavor. So it doesn't really taste like cheese. So I say those are all terrific things that, yes, they should be part of our, our pantry. And there's no good reason not to, to have them part uh, of our pantry. They've been sort of stigmatized. But on the other hand, there's a, I was fascinated to find in the, in the new book, there's a passage um, about foraging for morels in the Pacific Northwest, near where mm -hmm. you live, because there is sort of a perception that you, know, you don't actually go outside. So <laughs> very yes, often. Yes, I, I have so, the sallow um, complexion of a <laughs> programmer. That is a fact. Um, but uh, it seems that you're quite fond of, uh, of the wilderness and, and, and morels in particular. You know, it, um, it's a false dichotomy to suggest that uh, this kind of, I, I view the kind of cooking we do as informed cooking. Right. Um, uh, there was a, a food writer in the UK that inter interviewed me and they said, what made you think you should put science in the kitchen? I said, Science is always in the kitchen. I'm just taking the ignorance out. <laughs> okay? The laws of nature are how the world works. Now, would you want to fly in an airplane designed by a guy who didn't understand the laws of nature? Probably not. <laughs> You'd really like that airplane to hold together, stay in the sky, so on and so forth. Well, it, by the same token, understanding 
what is great about cooking and how cooking works informs how you do it. So we love wild ingredients. We love farm to table. There's another false dichotomy as people say, oh, well, sure. there's the farm to table movement and that's totally different than right. what you do. Not at all. Um, it, it's great ingredients are the start of great cooking and we, we, we believe that as, as much as anybody else. But then we try to celebrate those ingredients and understanding how cooking works helps you do that. Um, uh, last night for the uh, part of this New York um, uh, Food and Wine Festival, uh, we served a dinner, and one of the uh, the dishes that we made, uh, we sometimes call split pea soup, but we split the peas a different way than normal. We grind up peas, and we put them in a centrifuge. This is 27,000 times Earth's normal gravity. Thank you for the reminder on that. I'm, I'm bad with numbers. <laughs> uh, well, that gives you three things. Um, it gives you a pea broth, which is this intensely sweet, almost clear pea consomme. It gives you a pea starch we typically don't use because it's pretty flavorless. And it gives you this thin, thin layer of something we call pea butter, which tastes intensely of peas. Now, I, I've got a whole thing where I talk about celebrating ingredients. And so you, if you want something earthy, you do the earthiness. And if you want meaty, you talk about meatiness. And unfortunately, when you talk about peas, <laughs> You know, this is about celebrating the essential penis of the dish. Um, but it. My you, son just started cracking up. <laughs> you taste peas in a different way than you've ever tasted them before. Sure. And I make no apology for using this machine, which all it does is spin it really fast, okay? It's not, it sounds like oh, a centrifuge, like it's weird technology. You're spinning it really fast. Your, your dryer all has a spin cycle for the same reason. So. I think that, in fact, it's respecting peas as an ingredient to put them through this process and allow you to taste peas in ways you've never tasted them before. Your mission is, in part, to figure out what happens to food when we cook it. Is there anything that remains a mystery? Oh, sure. Um, there's uh, one of the interesting parts of doing uh, the book is uh, a lot of things where I thought, well, surely the world has figured this out. The answer is, nope, nope, world hasn't figured it out. Such as? Um, well, to take the uh, decanting thing as an example. Sure. Uh, there's two hypotheses people have about why decanting works. Um, one is that you are um, oxidizing uh, the various things. So you're exposing the wine to oxygen. And a traditional decanter has got a, like a big uh, surface area inside. And the way the sommelier pours it is they pour it so the wine sheets over the inside. Now, Partially that looks really cool because you see the wine sheeting and the light comes through it and so forth. But the main reason to do that, uh, the story is told, is to expose it to oxygen. Well, there's another thing that's a possible hypothesis, which is that you're uh, causing it to outgas. That there are gases dissolved in, um, in the wine and you're causing those gases to come out of solution. So we did a test and we did our blender test but where we had, uh, in one case, we would have the blender have pure nitrogen uh, flooding the blender. So it couldn't get any oxygen at all. The other one, we put pure oxygen in. And it, our conclusion, the two were almost exactly the same. So the oxygen mm -hmm. wasn't the factor. Outgassing appears to be the factor. Yeah. And that makes sense because there's a number of gases that you know are going to be in wine. Sulfur dioxide is one example. You use sulfites in certain aspects of, uh, of winemaking. There'll be a little bit of CO2 left over from the, the fermentation. Um, there's a bunch of volatile acids that are, are in wines. And so that outgassing process is probably more important. But when I tell wine experts, I say, well, you know, did you, have you really proven it? And the answer is no. You need to do a series of things with a gas cr chromatograph to really prove all that. And maybe for our next book, we'll gear up to do that, maybe not. Mm -hmm. uh, Wherever you look, you discover there's huge mysteries uh, that the world hasn't figured out yet, mm -hmm. even in the most common cooking scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, it's safe to say you're an omnivore, yes. And, and it seems safe to say that philosophically you're something of a libertarian, based on what I understand. <laughs> that just, I, I, you know, what I've um, read. I, 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 I use those to, to frame a question that's a little bit of a wild card, but I'm wondering sort of how you feel about the foie gras ban in California and issues like that. Um, so it, so I, it, one of the great producers of foie gras 
in the United States is just uh, an hour or so north of here in the Hudson Valley. Right. So I have been there and I have watched the ducks being force fed. I, I don't think that particular thing is cruel at all. Okay, so here's what happens. They have a, the ducks are kept in these little pens. And each pen is about the size of this red thing here, maybe a little bit smaller, because they, they put about a dozen ducks in there. And then the guy who does the force feeding steps into the pen, I've stepped in with him, and immediately the ducks mob us. And they're all going, ah, 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 ah. And, and, and they're coming up, and it's, it's like when you have a dog humping your leg. Um, they're like coming up to me, and they're going, ah, ah, ah. And so the, the guy's got a funnel, and the funnel has a, an electric drill or electric uh, screw, screwdriver thing with a little bit of an auger. And he's got a, a, a little measured amount, and each, each duck comes up and goes, ah, ah, ah. And, and they, he, each one gets its little measured dose of grain. Um, and, of course, they do slaughter the ducks. And it's gross when they slaughter the ducks. But I've been to, uh, to places where they slaughter chickens. Let me tell you, that's no less gross. Um, you know, so ultimately, we eat animal foods, which means there's some unpleasantness that, that happens to those animals. And if you're going to do that, I don't think it's actually worse for foie gras. So, uh, you know, in terms of the foie gras ban, I think that most of those things are pretty gimmicky. Mm. Um, now, if people from an ethical basis don't want to eat meat, I'm perfectly fine with that also. I, 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 I'm not really a libertarian from a broad perspective, but on a food perspective, I am. Mm. Okay? People should eat what they really want to eat. The, the part that bothers me is when there's a hypocrisy involved. Mm -hmm. So the organic movement is a great example of this. It's been mostly undercut by people chiseling the rules. So one of the things we discuss in our first book is when um, they first made an official uh, US Department of Agriculture organic thing, there was a set of 10 ingredients that you were allowed to have and still call it organic, even though they're manifestly not organic, OK? Um, and the, there was this great passage in the original legislation that said, well, of course, this is just for a transition period because these will be taken away. Today, 30 years later, those 10 items are now 200. Hmm. And big food companies have learned that we'll all pay more for organic. And so they produce it in this industrial level. It used to mean organic was, yeah, that stuff grown by that hippie couple on the outside of town that would sort of bring it to market, and the apples would be all kind of ugly, but, but they would taste really good because they'd be this heirloom variety. Not anymore. Hmm. So you know, it, it's great if you want to eat organic. Um, you should be informed, though, that some of what you're doing is organic. Is, here's another example. If you go to uh, big... Uh, uh, natural food chains, maybe some that begin with the letters W, F. <laughs> um, you can buy nitrite-free bacon, and it's red. Now, the thing that makes bacon red is nitrites. So how do you get nitrite-free bacon that's still red and tastes like bacon? The answer is you use concentrated celery juice, right. which, guess what, is very high in nitrites. Well, this is the saddest part yeah. of the whole thing, which is that we could go on for hours. This is totally fascinating, but we ac have actually run out of time. I am thrilled to have had this conversation. It was just totally fascinating. So thank you so much.